So my idea is to present something about systematic reviews. Uh, we'll make a presentation. There'll be some activities that I'd like you to undertake, question and answer sessions. And I'd like to focus in my presentation on writing tips, because I presume some of you would like to use what you are learning through this uh, course to submit manuscripts, but frequently manuscripts after review uh, may be rejected, and then you may need revision, but I would like for you to be able to go through in one cycle and have your manuscript accepted. So uh, uh, I hope you will be able to learn something not just about systematic reviews, trials, and diagnostic research, but also about how to present what you have done in a manner that you can convince journal editors and peer reviewers quickly. And convincingly, get yourself uh, onto the publication uh, ladder. So here are the five different sets of uh, systematic review uh, uh, taken from this publication. And this publication is, uh, a, is is a very brief summary of the book that uh, that was referred to just a moment ago. And uh, if you don't mind, I expand a little bit on my own history. I started medical school in 1983 in Pakistan. I had an opportunity to work in Kenya, where I started career as a gynecologist. Uh, returned to Pakistan, then went to McMaster University in Canada, and then I worked in the UK for several years. Uh, and. Uh, Recently, I moved to uh, Spain in University of Granada. The University of Granada has uh, a university over 500 years old. And uh, you see in the picture on the right hand side, the Alhambra Palace. Um, you, you may or may not know that the journey to discover uh, what we call the new world, the two North and South Americas um, started here in Granada when the queen called Israel gave the money requested by uh, Christopher Columbus or Cristobal Colon, as we call him in Spanish, uh, in 1492, just last month. Uh, was the annual celebration of the of the, of this discovery, uh, and I live just where this palace that you look uh, that you're looking at in the picture is. So I, I I'm very happy to be able to present the webinar to you from this location. Well, superimposed on this journey, what happened to my research career? So I had my first publication in 1990. Uh, soon after my training in research in uh, in 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 in, uh, in Canada, I had my first publication of a systematic review. So you can see that I've been in this business of writing papers and systematic reviews for nearly 25 to 30 years. And uh, I had the opportunity to edit various journals, including editor in chief of the British Journal of, of Obstetrics and Ecology. Uh, here is uh, a graph showing several of my, of my, uh, citations to my publications. I had the opportunity to present about uh, research and systematic reviews in more than 37 countries, uh, including your own. 
the most important thing about my publications here you see my 150 publications listed uh, by year of publication most important thing about this is this orange line which represents the number of participants whose data were used in um, the papers I have been able to summarize in the systematic reviews. You can see that reviews are quite large with more than 100 studies included. Uh, but some reviews are also quite small with around 10 or 15 studies. Um, and the total number of the participants in my views exceeds several tens of millions. So I like to highlight from what I present here that the most important thing about a review is not just your self as an author of a review or the papers included inside your review, but actually the data given by the patients who consented to take part and permitted the use of their data to allow for the publication and then for development of an improvement of clinical practice. So we'll move on uh, from here onwards to talking about what is evidence-based medicine and systematic reviews. How can we develop a research question and a search strategy? And then I also like you yourself to undertake a little activity concerning preparation of uh, a research question. But before I proceed, May I just ask if you have any questions or comments which you do by by writing a comment or unmuting your microphone and uh, asking me the question directly. Uh, stop here for a moment, take a sip of my cup of tea and see if you have any question or comment. Okay, so I presume you can all hear me well. You can see my slides and that you don't have any question or comment at this stage and I can proceed. So with that, we go on to the next uh, stage, which is what do clinicians want uh, from... Uh, or researchers. So I understand most of you are undertaking a PhD program. Our objective is to produce uh, science and the clinician objective is to use the science that you will publish as publications uh, in journals or as a thesis like to pick up this published material and combine it with the belief, judgment, and intuition. And this combination will hopefully allow them to provide treatments to their patients in a way that their patients will in the end be able to get a higher quality of care. So from what I just said, I guess you can see that I'm talking about evidence-based medicine. The key thing I want to highlight is that this thing on the right-hand side of the slide, i.e. The, the papers published, form the E for the practice of evidence-based medicine. So... 
for a clinic, a, when they face a problem, they should be able to form a clear question, search the literature. By searching the literature, they will acquire the papers that could address their question. Hopefully, some of these papers are written by yourselves. And um, you raise your paper. If they find that the information contained in your paper is trustworthy, and hopefully they will be able to apply the findings of your papers to improve clinical practice. So the key thing is for you to undertake your research in a manner that when it is assessed by others, it is found to be uh, trustworthy. And if it is found to be trustworthy, then they can use it for improving clinical practice. So how does this work in real life when a clinical problem is faced? Clinician or clinical team can use their experience, expertise to make decisions, or they can ask questions, acquire literature, appraise the information, and combine this with their experience to make decisions. And hopefully, these are more refined and uh, nuanced with respect to clinical care. So what type of research is there which clinicians can use? Uh, so I, for the purpose of simplicity, break research down in what I call laboratory research, or research that uses data directly from patients or groups of patients uh, living in organized societies or populations. And we can call this patient-centered research and research that is that, is, that deploys cells and tissues which may or may not come from human beings as laboratory research. And I like to make the distinction that laboratory research is designed to improve knowledge, whereas patient-centered research is designed to help make decisions. Uh, this is a big distinction between the two types of research. Uh, you can call the laboratory research basic research and patient-centered research as applied research. So when we talk about applied research, we are talking about how lab research can be changed into health impact. And this involves a journey which is called translational journey. And this goes through various steps. And again, for the purpose of simplicity, we can call this going from translation from lab to the very basic levels as T1 research. But then at the next level from clinical efficacy research to clinical effectiveness called T2. And then at the next level from effectiveness to evidence synthesis, which is what we will be talking about today called T3. And at the end of evidence synthesis leading to guideline implementation called T4. And then finally, all of this is into practice, which leads to health impact. So feasibility and pilot studies could be described as uh, as uh, as being T2 translation. Multi-center large clinical trials can be defined as um, well, clinical effectiveness research or T3 translation. Systematic reviews leading to guideline is called T4 translation. And uh, I presume for many of you, your projects probably fall in the category of T2 translation. Uh, I'd also like to highlight to you that systematic reviews 
are not a million miles away from T2 translation. Uh, feasibility studies, before going into multi-center studies, may require systematic reviews in order to allow us to discover how best to design multi-center studies. And then before multi-center studies can go into definitive systematic reviews, uh, there be there may be further further revisions deploying further systematic reviews and this eventually then leads into guidelines that can have an that can have impact so you can see that the techniques that we will review today together apply not to large multi center studies but also apply to small early pilot and feasibility studies in order to define and deliver progress in translation from basic to, to applied research and then into health impact. So I give you here an example of a randomized trial that was conceived in 1996 and after going through a multi-center phase where nearly 20 hospitals took part, were completed 10 years later, uh, with more than 500 patients recruited, and was in fact then published three years later. But during this time, after conception of the idea, the first Systematic review was published in 1997. And then during the course of the trial, a further systematic review was published four years later. And before the end of recruitment, a further systematic review was published uh, another five years later. And then yet another systematic review was published before the publication of this trial. And then at the end of this trial, a further systematic review was published. So you can see that the opportunities to system, systematically synthesize or put together research as it becomes available uh, are many. And uh, even during the course of your own thesis work, you, within your own topic, you may have more than one opportunity to uh, conduct and publish systematic reviews. So, for example, the first opportunity that will arise for you to write a systematic review will be with respect to writing the background chapter of your thesis. Here is, a, here, here, here is a outline provided for evidence-based practice that a practitioner should look first for guidelines and evidence summaries. If these don't exist, then they should look for actual systematic reviews. If reviews don't exist, then they should look for primary research. And if such research does not exist, then they should conduct their own research. And I guess this type of principle can be also applied in your own thesis work. Um, people often ask, well, what's the difference between reviews and systematic reviews? Well, here is the difference. Uh, reviews and commentaries are like the back chapters that you would have read in many published theses. They are frequently based on information that mixes opinion with evidence. For systematic review, the idea is to limit this so that you don't just use evidence available to you and to your supervisors. 
but you use all the evidence available in the literature on the question or topic that you would like to study. And in this process, you use critical appraisal and quality assessment in order to limit bias. And meta-analysis is simply a statistical technique applied judiciously to the studies collated inside your systematic review in order to make sense of the information collected. And uh, sometimes we can make sense of the information collected without the need for performing a meta-analysis. So this is a very brief summary of what is a systematic review, what is a meta-analysis, and how this is different from a review or a commentary. I hope that by the end of this webinar series that we will have over three days, that you will be able to think about how you can convert the background chapter of your thesis into a systematic review that can be published in a peer review journal. Um, here I highlight to you the importance of conducting systematic reviews. So in 1993, uh, the total number of kilograms of albumin sold in Scotland and Northern Ireland was this much and this number remained constant until a systematic review showed that using this product in intensive care units uh, in fact was associated with higher not lower mortality and once the systematic review was published, the sales of this product went down, indicating that, in fact, clinicians were able to change their practice in light of the data collected and synthesized and published form of a systematic review and meta-analysis. And you can also see that as a result, hopefully the mortality associated uh, with, the, with the inappropriate use of this product uh, went down in the, in, in the end, helping patients and improving the quality of care delivered in intensive care units. I encourage you strongly to think about performing system reviews and publishing them because you might be able to do some good uh, in the area of practice in in your field. So the different steps of conducting a systematic review, framing questions, searching the literature, identifying studies and um, identifying studies and uh, uh, extracting data from them then performing synthesis, whether or not with meta-analysis, a judgment to be made at that time, and finally summarizing that information to provide uh, findings to clinicians in a way that can be understood for informing clinical practice. But typically, this type of activity takes an effort from a large number of people over a long period of time and in the future it may be possible to change all of this through artificial intelligence and we may be able to get computers to help us to do this quickly and rapidly but that time is not today today we're going to have to think through how we can do this working together in teams. Uh, the area of use of artificial intelligence to assist in systematic reviews is very rapidly developing. 
So I, I have no doubt that in a few years when I am making such a presentation, I'll be talking to you about how to use artificial intelligence to do this process uh, of uh, systematic review quickly and rapidly. But today we'll talk about what the process is rather than how softwares can help. And there is the book uh, that was mentioned earlier. It's in, translated in, in, in Chinese and uh, in German from its English edition. And uh, we are in the process of the third edition, which will also be translated in uh, Spanish. The first step is framing questions. In order to understand how to frame questions, we've got to think of what is the clinical process. Uh, the process is the patient presents to us. They have some knowledge about their etiology and pathogenesis, of the condition they are presenting with, and we may make the diagnosis of the condition using history, examination, and tests. Once we have the diagnosis, we can give therapy which can hopefully improve the prognosis and achieve a better outcome. For each one of these of this steps in the clinical process, we have uh, corresponding types of research, etiologic research, for the first element of the process, diagnostic research for the second, and prognostic and therapeutic research for the next. And each one of this type of research can be either primary research where data is collected directly from patients. <coughs> or it can be uh, systematic reviews, which collects data from public papers. So I hope you can see the relationship between different steps, clinical process, how primary research can be conducted to assist in each step, and that that research can be put together to conduct systematic reviews to inform each one of the steps. And whether we conduct primary research or systematic reviews, we got to formulate our questions in a way that can be formulated into scientific hypotheses for which we can conduct search to answer the question. 